Oh, welcome to Your Health, Your Choice. Uh, we are live tonight now. It's October, Wednesday, October the 23rd, because on every program I say we are live. And the reason I'm saying we are live tonight is because um, when we replay these programs, you can't call in or you can't WhatsApp your questions. But uh, tonight, um, we will be opening up the lines after about half an hour or so, and we will um, be allowing you to WhatsApp your questions as well. So Your Health, Your Choice, um, this program has been going for many years. And it's all about empowering you to make the right decisions about your health. Your health is indeed your choice. And uh, tonight, uh, we are very privileged to have uh, the uh, president of the Diabetic Association, the Diabetic Association of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Uh, Andrew Danu. Thanks for having me. That's Good to that. have you, Andrew. We have been meaning to do this program for quite a while, and yeah. things Our kept... schedules never lined yes. up. And things, no has. <laughs> things kept coming up. But I think it's an appropriate time because, mm -hmm. of course, November coming, um, it's, uh, we're going to have World Diabetes Day mm -hmm. and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, the Diabetic Association of Trinidad and Tobago is, I guess, the longest established association mm -hmm. um, led by lay people mm -hmm. in diabetes mm -hmm. um, in Trinidad. But before mm -hmm. we get to that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about yourself, mm -hmm. um, your background, because you became president of the mm -hmm. Diabetic Association, was it? Just about a year ago. One year ago. Yeah. And um, before yourself was Mr. Carlton Phillip, mm -hmm. who was there for many years. Yeah, many, and, many years. And we want to say hello to him if he's looking on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you became president last year. But mm -hmm. what is your background in terms of, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the reasons that motivated you for wanting to get involved mm -hmm. in diabetes education? So my background is in biochemistry. So I'm a clinical biochemist. Uh, and I'm a universe, uh, researcher at the University of the West Indies. Um, I was introduced to the Diabetes Association probably about eight years ago when I was um, doing an internship with Johns Hopkins University, right. who was down here doing a project on the TTHDI. Yes. That's the first time that I knew about the association when we were invited um, with Dr. Hillbriggs, who was here entering that uh, symposium. Um, so I never knew about the organization, so I saw that there were a group of patients who were trying to help themselves. So I was invited by Zubida, Zubida Ragbir Singh, who, yes, who was who, a former president, former president as yes. well. Um, and she invited me to come out to the meetings first in Princess Town, which was one of their branches. Um, from there, I realized that it's an organization whereby we could really do a lot of work in helping patients because there's so much help and so much need in Trinidad for patients that the public health system can't take care of the Diabetes Association is able to now fill that need or fill that gap. So I was able to see that the need is there and moving up into the association, going at, at, from the branch level down up, up into the national executive, um, I became a scientific advisor. Right. And from there I became the first vice president. Mm -hmm. And last year I was elected as the president of the association. So, I mean, I have to congratulate you. When mm -hmm. I heard that you were elected as mm -hmm. the president, I was... Um, Elated, actually, because <laughs> I think um, you have much to offer in exactly. terms of um, uh, diabetes education mm -hmm. and the um, de development of the Diabetic mm -hmm. Association of Trinidad and Tobago. So, um, as you say, it's a, an association that um, you're not heard much about. Mm -hmm. um, for me, when I initially came back to Trinidad in 2006, I heard about the Diabetic Association and got mm -hmm. involved to a limited extent, mm -hmm. but not a lot of doctors yes. seem to be involved. Yes. Yes. with that and we had formed mm -hmm. with Johns Hopkins also mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. called the Diabetes Academy, Academy exactly. um, which is another story and I'm mm -hmm. not going to get into that mm -hmm. but um, I, you know the Diabetic Association of Trinidad and Tobago if you, if you could give us a little historical perspective as yeah. from your knowledge about mm -hmm. how long has it been going mm -hmm. and you know is it a registered NGO mm -hmm. things like so, that. So we are we are a registered NGO we're a charitable organization and the association is actually 30 years old this year. So we're in, we're in, we're, we were enacted by an act of parliament in 1989, right. uh, which makes us 30 years. That's how old I am. So right. I'm as old as the association is. And, and you are right. Um, traditionally, the association has been a lay organization. It hasn't right. been an organization where doctors and uh, clinicians would have been involved in because it is a really patient-centered organization. And at the head of it, were always patients. So, so now, however, over the last seven to eight years, um, and even more recently, we are now doing more professional activities and aligning ourselves with academic institutions. So my background at UE has afforded me 
the opportunity to invite a lot of medical professionals, lecturers, other professionals in areas that not just are medically related, but outside the field. Right. But I was able to, and not, not just myself, but also persons in the organization are now able to recruit more of those types of persons who are becoming more interested in helping in the organization. So we're moving forward, not just in the support group that we used to have, but also we're having national events, we're having research projects, and that's very important. So, so, no, so that was one of the things over the years that, um, and, and by the way, if you um, are on Facebook, um, you can go onto the ACTN, The Voice site. We're also streaming live on Facebook and share the site as well. Um, one of my that's a concerns mm -hmm. um, when Johns Hopkins came in, um, and I, I think you know people like yourself and um, uh, quite a few younger people got involved with mm -hmm. research projects, is mm -hmm. um, the research potential we have has not really been tapped in mm -hmm. sufficiently well. Mm -hmm. Now, you are... Very well. You're you you're a researcher at UWI, um, and so you might be much more abreast of the research that is going mm -hmm. on in, in diabetes. Mm -hmm. But in my you know from my point of view, I think the Diabetic Association should really be one of the driving forces exactly. behind that. Exactly. So my aim, just like working with Johns Hopkins and working with Dr. Hillbricks, who was the who was I think the president of the ADA last year, mm -hmm. American Diabetes Association, and speaking to her. I'm telling her that the Diabetes Association, I want to make it at the level of ADA in the Caribbean. Meaning we, we need to be the authority on diabetes, not just in Trinidad, but in the Caribbean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. no, no, so, so that's extreme. And, and I'm excited that you're saying that because uh, going to the American Diabetic Association conferences every mm -hmm. year, I always reflected on the difference between the ADA mm -hmm. and the and Diabetic Association of Trinidad and Tobago, which was with all the good intentions mm -hmm. run by lay people with a lot of enthusiasm and I have mm -hmm. to say they have done a, an amazing Tremendous job over yeah. the years yeah. educating people mm -hmm. and I, I guess you'll tell us a little bit about the branches etc um, but I think one of the things I was concerned about was that um, researchers were not mm -hmm. involved mm -hmm. um, it, although there was a scientific board and in mm -hmm. fact I think I was on the you scientific, the scientific board, board at some yeah. stage, but I really was not I active. Think, yeah, exactly, I was not because active. the organization hasn't really pushed that. Right. So I think, like a lot of older persons in Trinidad, when I say older, I mean probably 80s and 70s, some of them are a little bit afraid of the word research. Right. And when I came into the organization, some of them were afraid of the word research, but then they realized that research just means getting answers to questions. And there are lots of questions that we need answers to. There's a couple of projects that we are doing in Trinidad right now through the Diabetes Association. One of the projects are we're looking at complementary and alternative medicines, herbal medicines. Right. What is the impact on diabetes? So I'm going to ask you, that's a question I'm going to come to mm -hmm. in, in, in a few, if we have time, because it's a question that I'm always asked mm -hmm. um, by my patients. And um, I have some strong views mm -hmm. and I have been mm -hmm. very outspoken, so I'm not going to put you on the spot, but mm -hmm. it's, I think it's something that we do need it's to address. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but before we, we come to that, um, if you had to kind of summarize the main aims mm -hmm. of the Diabetic Association, I mean, what would you right. say your philosophy, your main aims are? So we have three main goals, which are research, advocacy, and, re and education. Primary goal has always been education. Right. So education of persons living with diabetes, education of persons who um, are at risk for diabetes, and most recently, we have been at the thrust of educating children about diabetes. So we're educating children, we're educating for prevention, but we're also educating for management. Right. Advocacy, meaning we are the ones who stand up for persons living with diabetes. We are the ones who should have the voice to say this is wrong and this is right. When something is going on, either the government is doing something that we, we don't agree with, that, that should not be done, a private entity or a person. Mm -hmm. So we are the voice that should stand up in the country and say this is wrong or this is right. right. And of course, research, as we've been talking about, we need to get answers to questions. And yes. there are lots of questions locally that no one else can answer but someone in Trinidad. Yes. And those are, the, those are the types of research projects that we want to take on. Right. So we've looked at the history of um, diabetes, your main um, goals. Now, you have lots of branches. Mm -hmm. um, you're spread throughout the country. and um, I've been invited on several occasions to do talks to patients, etc. Um, so the branches are spread 
throughout, throughout the country. Yeah. How, how many branches do you have? So currently we have 18 branches. Right. Um, as far north as, well, Mason Hall, Tobago, mm -hmm. and, and as far south as Erin. Right. So we have uh, two in Tobago and 16 in Trinidad. Um, we are trying to expand right now, so we're moving further into the east. We're going to go, because the furthest east we have is probably Arima. Um, then we're going to go to Grandi, but we have a Nerea Mayaro branch right now. And then we're going to go into more rural areas. Right. So these branches aren't brick and mortar locations. Our head office is in Chagonas, and this yes. is the only physical office we have. Our branches are support groups. Right. And these are groups of primarily patients, but also now we're including a lot more physicians are part of the support group, nurses are part of the support mm -hmm. group. And this support group usually meets once a week, uh, sorry, once a month. And beyond that, they would have that support system within their membership where they educate each other, they, they check up on each other. Mm -hmm. And we have noticed that when persons join Diabetes Association within a year, within a, less than a year, their, their numbers go down, their A1Cs Please. go okay. down. Their, their cholesterol, their, their lipid profiles, they, they, those values go down and they're more, more, much more controlled. Mm -hmm. And we see that because they're much more aware of what they're doing. Yeah. And those little pieces of information that we're able to give to them makes a huge difference in their lives. You know, we often talk about <coughs> the team approach and mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm a big advocate for the team approach of that to diabetes care. Um, unfortunately, um, in Trinidad, we're very doctor-centered. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Again, having worked in the UK for 15 years, um, being exposed to the team approach where, in fact, the doctor is just one of the team members revolving around the patient. Um, one of the more successful groups that I was involved in was the Kuva mm -hmm. Diabetic Support Group. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, they did some amazing, and they're still doing, I'm and no longer with the Southwest yeah. now, but um, they did some amazing programs over the years. And I have to say it was driven mm -hmm. mainly I was the face of some of the programs. Mm -hmm. um, it was driven by, by one of our lead pharmacists, mm -hmm. uh, Mavis. Mavis, um, yeah. Fantastic person, passionate mm -hmm. about diabetes, mm -hmm. and some of our lead nurses at Hoover. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you know, you're absolutely right. The diabetic groups um, can empower our patients. But how, how do people become members of the group? What, yeah. what do they have to do? So, so currently to become a member, you need to fill out a form. Right. Um, and as I told you before, we're trying to update everything. So now we're going to have um, membership applications online. Right. So you fill out the form, you pay the membership fee, and then what we do is we assign you, if you do want to go to our meetings, we assign you to the closest branch. Right. Or you can become a member and not go to meetings, but I'll just support nationally at our events throughout the year. Um, and it's simple as that. Right. So membership is $100 a year, 150 for two. 200 for three years. Right, okay. Um, so the forms are available from the office itself yep. or are, are yep. they available from the so, health centers? So forms are available from the office, right. um, from the Diabetes Association office, also through the members and also through our branches. Okay. Now, however, within for the month of November, Diabetes Awareness Month, we're going to have the forms available online. Right, so I was just going to say that we're becoming much more technological mm -hmm. and um, a lot of people are going online. So the they should to... be able to have the forms online. Right. And then some of our partner um, companies that we work with should have forms available there as well. Okay. So we're going to have forms throughout where people could be able to become members of the association because we want to ramp up our advertising. We want to ramp up our membership. Right. Because there are lots of benefits for members. So that was my next question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people, uh, they pay a nominal fee mm -hmm. um they have meetings yeah. once a month but beyond that mm -hmm. what are some of the benefits of becoming a member of the diabetic right. association i know you touched on a few but yeah. can we just recap yeah. that so so like other organizations one of the things you have is with your card right. so with your membership card there are discounts available at, at various partners part, partner companies but beyond that because we're not just a, an organization where you have a card and you swipe and you get a, a discount beyond that membership gives you value in terms of promoting health. So one of the things we've started, we have free retinopathy screening at the Diabetes Association now. Okay. Through Trinidad Eye Hospital, we're working right. with them and we have free retinopathy screening. Excellent. Another thing we've started is A1C testing. Right. So we have point of care A1C testing at $80. Right. Which I think is the yes, cheapest anyway yeah. in Trinidad. Yeah. Um, total lipid lipid panel, total total cholesterol. So patients can literally just walk into walk your in office? Walk in and they get it. And you just have to walk, yeah, walk into the Diabetes okay. Association. They don't office. have to have a request form or no, no. anything. They can just come in. Mm -hmm. right. And then the results that they get 
they can now take those results to their doctor. Right. So those results, and we're actually using a lab to validate and, and consistently um, check that, we, that all of our machines are up to date and, and working properly. And, so, and, sorry, and mm -hmm. can I just say again to everyone who's listening, if you are diabetic and you have never had any 1C done, it's one of the most, uh, unbelievably, mm -hmm. Andrew, I still have people coming to me having had diabetes for five, ten years, and you ask them about the A1C, and know. there's a blank mm -hmm. expression. So then I say, well, do you know that there's a blood test that gives you a three-month three average of your blood sugar? They may have heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, when last have you had it done? Um, <clears throat> now, I have to say, one of the challenges we had in the Southwest, and I can say it now probably a bit more freely, was mm -hmm. at times we didn't even have so we were running diabetic yeah. clinics it and a basic A1C was not available. And I continued to say to the managers and to the powers that be, it was impossible to run specialist mm -hmm. diabetic clinics or even uh, chronic, chronic disease clinics mm -hmm. without an A1C mm -hmm. or a proper lipid profile, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, I know what the cost is of yeah. A1Cs in normal labs. So $80 yeah. is, is very, very good. good. And, um, and you can get the point of care, the lipid mm -hmm. profile. Mm -hmm. um, and and so retinopathy screening. So that, mm -hmm. no, that's a big thing because mm -hmm. I know the, the um, Trinidad and Tobago Eye Hospital, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Bula and mm -hmm. his team. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we started retinopathy screening with Johns Hopkins, Hopkins yeah. in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And the plan was to extend that mm -hmm. to the rest of the country, which mm -hmm. unfortunately really happen. never happened. Yeah. May happen in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's very encouraging that um, Ronnie has trying to roll this yeah. and make it more available so mm -hmm. so you actually have cameras at the diabetic association so they bring it whenever we have the, the screening so we right. usually have screening one day per week thursdays okay. um and then for the month of november we have it free right so it's free on thursdays okay and again this is a service that we have spe especially for the month of november right. where we're going to have it for free okay i'm going to come back to that after our first break because mm -hmm. i just want to break down what we mean by written up the screening yeah. so people understand why it's mm -hmm. so, so important, important. Okay, we're going to go to our first break, and when we come back, we're going to continue with um, Andrew talking about Diabetic Association, but we're going to get into more specifics about the prevalence of diabetes, obesity, and the effect on um, our younger people in our, in our country. So we're going to go to our first break, and then we return to your health, your choice. Looking for a safe place for the whole family? Well, now you've found it. We are ACTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. Whether it's current affairs, kids and classic TV, sport and community features, Christian and music programming, plus so much more, ACTN is the station for you. Join us each day for programming that puts morals, values and family first. We are ACTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. Hi, I'm Becca Shea, and you're watching ACTN The Voice. You're watching ACTN The Voice. The Voice, your family-friendly station. Well, welcome back to Your Health, Your Choice. Um, it's uh, Wednesday, the 23rd of October. So we're going to open up the telephone lines in a few minutes, um, 6524855. Now, we're talking about diabetes, but we're talking more about the Diabetic Association and the role that the Diabetic Association has to play in um, patient education and the future of diabetes care in Trinidad. And I'm uh, very honored to have Mr. Andrew Danu with us. Um, Andrew is now the, has been the president of the Diabetic Association for the past year. And um, I have to say again, I congratulate you on that achievement because mm -hmm. I think you're probably one of the youngest I am the young presidents yeah. I, I think we have I'm, had. I'm, I think I'm the youngest on the board right now. As right, well too. okay. <laughs> So it's good to have younger people. I mean, you know, Mr. Carlton Phillip, mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Uh, Zabida Ragbar Singh, they did mm -hmm. great, a great job, but I think it's good that we have younger people getting mm -hmm. involved. 
I wanted to talk a little bit about the prevalence of diabetes and obesity mm -hmm. because I know the Diabetic Association has also been involved with, I think, Professor Paul Teloxing mm -hmm. and some of the work he's been doing. Mm -hmm. From your statistics, your knowledge, what is the kind of prevalence mm -hmm. of diabetes and then I know obesity mm -hmm. mirrors that? Yeah. So the problem with statistics is a lot of research has not been done. Right. So the last time that we actually have data would be the step survey. Okay. Um, and then quoted from the step survey would probably be the idea of Atlas. Right. The last edition that, was, that, that came out. Yes. And that Atlas would have given a prevalence rate of about 13.5% or about. Um, that was probably, I think, 2017, right. 2018, that that data would have come from, probably 2017. Yes. Um, from that, I think it's much higher than that right now because there have been no significant improvements in, in health, um, in terms of the health system since then. Mm. And then we are, we, are, we are casually observing more cases of diabetes, people with diabetes coming to us. Right. So I would say it will be hovering about 50, at about 15%. Okay. And, and that actually, uh, I often compare that when I'm doing lectures to a prevalence of about probably 6 to 7% in the US mm -hmm, and in the mm -hmm. UK about 3%. Mm -hmm. So our 15% prevalence is one of the higher mm -hmm. rates in the world. Exactly. And, and when looking at what IDF says, probably half of the, or double that, with a, with 15% on top of that, the 20% may be patients who, who are not diagnosed, right. who, don't, who don't know they have right. diabetes or pre-diabetic. Uh, so right, so mm -hmm. now we have the, the whole area of pre-diabetes and mm -hmm. you know, the, the intriguing thing about this I try to tell patients is that, especially when I have a patient, the parent and the, the, the children are there mm -hmm. who are probably in their um, 20s and 30s, we try to get the message across that you don't become diabetic overnight. Mm -hmm. The whole process of becoming diabetic, especially type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm can start up to five to 10 years before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and obesity, of course, is a big driving factor. Primary, so, yeah. I mean, how do you, uh, in terms of the Diabetic Association, mm -hmm. I know we have a, a small clip mm -hmm. to play, yeah. but before we go into that, mm -hmm. uh, obesity, what are your concerns yeah. about obesity? So, so we were invited to a joint select committee in Parliament um, about childhood obesity in January this year, um, where we presented some of the data from the Global School Health Survey, which was done in 2017. Right. From that survey, when comparing the last data, which was collected in 2007, 2011, we saw that there was an increase in prevalence rate for obesity and overweight children, and those are adolescent children, mm -hmm. from about 33% to about 53%. Okay. So we now have adolescent children, meaning secondary school children, half of our secondary school children, half. half uh, either overweight or obese. obese. Okay. So, so from that, and knowing that, we took the stance to do something about it. So for the first time, the Diabetes Association launched a teen lifestyle camp, where we decided to teach children about exercise, about being active, we right. teach them about cooking, and about how, what they put in their mouth by using cooking, and also teach them about stress management. Right. So, so I think we have a clip yeah, um, on this. That. So I'm going to ask Josh to... Um, bring up our first clip and then we can talk a little bit more, more about, about that. the whole area of obesity and pre-diabetes. come to clinic and they want to do diet and actually tell them to diet and exercise but they have no no direction and no help in order to get that done and this camp really what really is the foundation of that one week prior to um, this camp a screening test screening tests were done to determine if the children are um, overweight obese and what are their risk factors 
um, for developing diabetes. Okay, so thing that I like about the CAM so far is that they're teaching us different ways to make healthier choices when it comes to our diet and different ways and different methods of cooking healthier foods. And one thing that I have learned was that it's important, very important, to read the labels when it comes to buying foods, different foods, especially the serving size because it could be five calories, but the serving size could be two. So that will be 10 calories that you eat instead of five so it's very vital and important to look at the labels a special good morning to all of you here at the Crystal High School. My name is Hema Rantansoon and I want to thank you for the invitation to be here this morning. The Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago is very close to my heart and I know that Andrew and his team, uh, they've been doing an amazing job to ensure that we fight this disease and that we give our children a fighting chance. So today we have three teams. Uh, we have the judges that are already located at the head table. I'm just going to be making my way around because I'm not very good in the kitchen. So today I myself will be learning a thing or two from all of the youngsters who are here. Uh, they are preparing three dishes just to give you an idea but also uh, the three dishes will include a main dish, a snack and a smoothie because sometimes we don't know where the sugar is coming from. So in a couple minutes we will be beginning um, and uh, hopefully like me, you will all learn a thing or two and coming into the next school term, we'll all be better prepared to deal with the cafeteria. the camp has a positive effect on me and my daughter. So far, I see my daughter, nine years old, and she's underage for the camp because the camp was taken on from 13 to 17, and when I called and I told them my concern, I seen signs of pre-diabetes on her, I asked them to join her, and they did. They took her in, they screened her, right? They took her in, they screened her, and here we are at the camp. She's making better choices in her food and drinks, um, she doesn't want to see rice, she doesn't want to see pasta, she doesn't want to see uh, this soft drink and all these kind of things. She's making a lot of better choices. Mommy, we need to do this with the chicken. Mommy, we need to do that. We have to have more provision. We need to have more vegetables. And she's enjoying it. Diabetes has been a killer in my family for years. My daughter and I are breaking that chain. We are living a healthier life. Okay, so um, Andrew, that was a, an excellent clip and mm -hmm. that was uh, from the last diabetic camp you had yeah, teen lifestyle teen, camp, right so and that what age group were the kids because we so, weren't allowed to show the faces, the faces of, the kids. of some of them, yeah um so we had children from nine years old yes. till about 17 years um and most or all of them showed signs of pre-diabetes um some of them were siblings but we mm -hmm. had about 35 children okay. uh some of the la the bigger kids there were ue students who came and, and acted as peer counselors right. and they they, would, they stayed with them over the course of three days and again we taught them about exercise we taught them about nutrition and we, <coughs> they actually competed against each other and they made their own meals i'm excited about this because mm -hmm. now we have this conversation with our patients so often about lifestyle mm -hmm. Um, and okay, so we, we're going to talk a little bit about type 1 diabetes because people get confused about type 1 and type 2. Mm -hmm. But we know that um, lifestyle factors have a large part to play mm -hmm. in the evolving of type 2 diabetes. But uh, genetics is a big thing and, and, and that's, I think, misunderstood. But mm -hmm. let's just focus on the lifestyle because, mm -hmm. Andrew, I think you're absolutely right. If we can catch our kids in teenage years mm -hmm. or even from uh, toddlers, yeah. 
and begin to teach them about healthy eating um, and exercise, exercise mm -hmm. because we know the pressures of academia in this country is so strong. Mm -hmm. So kids stop exercising exactly. from, from 9, 10 years old. Um, but if we can get them to, to, to be excellent, and I know you're going to tell us a little bit about your initiatives mm -hmm. for November, World Diabetes Day coming up on yeah. November the 14th. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think those, what is your, I know it's hard to judge your success rate, mm -hmm. but how, how the response you're getting from the yeah. public about so, this? So it's been phenomenal. Um, all limitation has just been reaching out for, for getting the message out there that we have had these caps. Right. So we put out, put out notices on social media and we would have gotten about 50 children who were recruited and we were able to screen over the course of a couple of weeks. We just put it out and we got, we got that. Um, and then at the camp, we had about 35 children. At the camp, after the first day of the camp, the parents came the next day, a lot of parents came the next day and told us how much the lives of the children were changed or impacted. Because just like the mother said in the video, when they went home, they were more conscious about what they were putting in their mouth. Right. They were telling the parents what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat. Yes. When the parents took them to the supermarket, they showed the parents how to read a label, what they should use, what they shouldn't use. Right. So just that alone was impactful. Of course, we are tracking these children over the course of the next year. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to see what progress they have made. And we're going to meet them up again. But additional to this, the Ministry of Health has so seen the impact of the camp. And they've committed to sponsoring camps for us throughout the entirety of Trinidad and Tobago next year. I mean, that's, that's uh, really, really you know, mm -hmm. exceptional because I think if, if the Ministry of Health um, has the vision yeah. to spread this word around, because mm -hmm. the problem, as you know, um, is that we're picking up people with diabetes often five to ten years after, in, in, after yeah. they've been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and very commonly, you know, we, we were going to come back to the whole retinopathy screening. Mm -hmm. um, patients are referred to us um, having gone to an eye specialist just for, or to the optometrist just for a routine um, eye check, mm -hmm. and they have picked up retinopathy. Mm -hmm. So the patient comes in, and now we have to tell them that they may have had diabetes for at least mm -hmm. 10 years mm -hmm. to have retinopathy. Mm -hmm. So the retinopathy screening you're doing is, is, is very, very important. But I think I would say even more important, as far as I would see it, is if we're going to deal with this epidemic of especially type 2 diabetes, we have to get our kids mm -hmm. educated on mm -hmm. healthy eating and families because yeah. the problem is sometimes, you know, you have a 75-year-old or 80-year-old come in mm -hmm. and children at, who are now the adults mm -hmm. are trying to tell me, please tell my mother or father to stop eating roti, mm -hmm. stop eating rice. And sometimes I look at the children and I say, look, your dear mother or father has been eating rice and roti mm -hmm. for the last 75 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to tell them about portion control. But we have missed the boat. Yeah, with them. We, we, can't, we can't change, we can't make those significant changes in persons who have done it all their lives. Yes. And, you're, and you're correct. And that's why earlier interventions are important. Right. We have chosen to intervene here at, at the teenage years. But of course, we know the earlier we intervene, the, the, the better it is or, or, or the more impact we have. Yes. Um, so beyond that, we've, always, we've also always been doing quizzes in school. So through quizzes and through competitions through, uh, well, Zobida Rag Racing would have started a DEEPS project. A um, couple of years ago, we expanded it nas nationally, where we did a national diabetes school quiz. And we had children from throughout the country learning about uh, um, insulin resistance and learning about insulin receptors. And right. uh, the, the primary school children learning about things that, 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 that probably some doctors may have forgotten. Mm. Yes. And it was phenomenal to see how um, enthusiastic they were about it. And we want to continue that. We want to continue that type of education in schools throughout the country. Right. And with that, I think we could impact a lot more children a lot, a lot earlier. So we are seeing more and more kids um, with type, type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to touch a little bit about type 1 diabe diabetes because I think in your camps, you have quite a few yeah, type 1s. So we ones have a separate camp for type 1s. Okay. Yeah. So well, I think we have to go to our second break. Time mm -hmm. is going very quickly. So we're going to go to our second break. Um, your health, your choice. We are live tonight. When we come back, you can ring if you have any pressing questions for Andrew on 652-4855. 652-4855. So we go to our second break and then we come back to your health, your choice. You're watching ACTN, The Voice.
WCTN The Voice, your family-friendly station. Come everyone to another edition of Football 101. Half season and things are looking gloomy for Madrid. Who is a Chelsea fan? Oh. I only know one side of Manchester and it's red. <laughs> I don't know what any blue side. Yes, I'm a Arsenal fan now. That's very unfortunate. I love you, Messi. Mike wanna say thank for No! What are you gonna do? We bring the field directly to your home. What's up y'all? This is the kid Flame. This is Spec. This is Mike Real. And you watching ACTN, the voice. Keep it locked. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Your boy's been a Christian quite a few years. Yeah. Victory and faith, uh -huh. but I failed in my fears. Man. I heard a lot of words that have tickled many ears. Uh -huh. That's why I praise God for the word that we adhere. The word became flesh. flesh. Live for 30 years. Welcome back to your health, your choice. Um, we are live tonight, October the 23rd. Uh, Wednesday, October the 23rd. We only have about 20 more minutes, so if you have any questions, you can ring in on 6524855, 6524855. Um, uh, we don't have the WhatsApp um, option tonight, um, but uh, this program is replayed. I'll tell you about that at the end. Um, Andrew, you also run a camp for type 1 diabetics, mm -hmm. and briefly, can you clarify again? I know we have done it on this mm -hmm. program. Um, the difference between type, type one. 1 and type 2 yeah. and why is it so important to mm -hmm. give support mm -hmm. to these type 1s? So, so basically the difference is the cause. The mm -hmm. cause of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, type 1 diabetes will be uh, a rarer form of the disease. So probably about 5% of the population of persons living with diabetes would be type 1. Um, and of course, it, it usually manifests earlier in childhood. Mm -hmm. So we usually tend to see children developing type 1 diabetes. And of course, these children go on to live long lives once they take care of themselves. Um, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition, which simply means that the body, um, for some reason we're not entirely sure about, attacks the pancreas and destroys the beta cells and they can't make insulin. Right. If they can't make insulin, they can't control blood sugar. And type 1 diabetes is a disease whereby you need to take insulin for the rest of your lives. Right. Uh, and that's, that, that, that's where it's so important. Type 2 diabetes would be. But well, we used to call it adult onset diabetes, mm. but now we're seeing it in, in, in children. Yes. Um, but with the type 1 diabetic children, these children, are it's so important to, to work with them and work with their families yes. because the onset is almost sudden. Yes. Meaning that usually the child is good one day, the next day the child starts to pee the bed, loses weight, and all of a sudden they take them to the doctor and the blood sugar is sky high. Yeah. You know, and I, I just want to say that having seen a lot of type 1s over the years, um, just last week, I, I saw a young girl, mm -hmm. just, just about 17 or 18, has been type 1 for about 7 or 8 years. Mm -hmm. Her A1C was greater than 14%. Wow. Now, great, it didn't even give a value, the lab, mm -hmm. greater than 14%. And as we sat and the mom was sitting and, and, and she was sitting with me, she broke into tears. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, my, my daughter is 20 and I, I felt so almost fatherly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because I could sense a struggle mm -hmm. with dealing with diabetes. She's losing weight. Mm -hmm. um, her diabetes is uncontrolled. She's having some other complications of diabetes. Um, and it's easy as healthcare professionals to kind of say, oh, you're not taking your insulin. Mm -hmm. you're, and, and to be very negative. I mean, what is your advice to healthcare professionals when we mm -hmm. meet, especially young people with type 1? How can we support them? Well, just like in the Diabetes Association, the support comes from working with the family, um, understanding that those children don't just have diabetes to deal with, but a lot of times on the onset of diabetes between the ages of probably, I've seen children, and I'm sure you have as young as two years yes. old, mm -hmm. um, as, 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 as old as in the twenties. But at this point in time, if you're a teenager or you're pubescent, you have all of the other stressors of life to deal with. You have exams to deal with, you have, all of the hormonal fluctuations to deal with, plus you have diabetes to deal with. Imagine all of that on top of having to deal with diabetes. Adults who have diabetes can hardly deal with it. Mm -hmm. So imagine some of these children, and then the, the impact is on their families. A lot of times I've noticed that a lot of, lot of families that have children with diabetes end up having a lot of family issues. Right. Um, 
maybe it is because of the stress of having to take care of that child or impact of having to take care of that child and not having the support in Trinidad simply because our health system is such that we only provide medicine for these children. Yes. So with the Diabetes Association and the camps that we do, we're working with the children, teaching them about how to take insulin, teaching them about how to eat, mm -hmm. teaching them about the support system that they need. So we actually have a WhatsApp group with mothers and fathers and parents um, and siblings of those children with diabetes, and they help one another. Yeah. Whenever we know someone who is newly diagnosed, we add them, we go and we go to the schools, um, and we support the, the families of these children. One of the projects that we're going to do is with teachers. Yes. So we're working with the Ministry of Health to roll out a program, hopefully in 2020, whereby we're going to go to schools, all schools, we're going to start with schools that actually have children living with diabetes, but we're going to go to all schools eventually and teach teachers about how to deal with children with diabetes, how to deal with hypoglycemia, how to deal with them having to take their insulin, how to deal with them having to, to eat at certain times. And we're able to now do those things because we know that the impact that we have on these children's lives could be humongous. Because a child like that, that you've seen yes. with a once year 14, may have never learned about the things that she's supposed to do. Yes. So those things are what we, we want to enforce. And, and, and we know that there's, there's a lot of psychological um, overlap mm -hmm. or overlay in, in type 2 diabetes, but type 1, mm -hmm. um, and that particular patient, I, I, was, I really tried to encourage them to see a, a, psych, mm -hmm. a psychologist mm -hmm. um, that we work with to work through some of the issues. Um, so I, th I think the support, uh, what's coming across here is that in both type 1 and type 2, it's not just about giving medication. Mm -hmm. It's not about just about writing a prescription. Mm -hmm. We must have a holistic approach, exactly. and I think that's what you're pushing. Exactly. We only have about 14 more minutes. Um, <clears throat> we, 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 we did say about the lines. I'm not sure if the lines are working, but um, the number is 652-4855, 652-4855. But, but you said you're doing some research into herbal mm -hmm. um, remedies and diabetes. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that, because I'm very interested mm -hmm. if there's emerging evidence mm -hmm. out there. So the first, the first part of the research is assessing the impact. So that's what we've started to do. We've been doing surveys throughout the country to find out what are these, these herbal supplements that people are taking? Why do they take it? So we want to know what is the prevalence, what, what sort of demographics are involved, and what reasons they have for taking it. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. So we're going to present that data. With presenting that data, we want to make policies, and we want to present policies to the Ministry of Health. One about advertising herbal supplements right. and how to advertise. Yes. Because, of course, as we know, as we all know, there's no regulation no that someone could see. Yes. So, yes, we know that as part of Trinidadian culture, herbal medicines or complementary and alternative medicines are a huge part of the culture. Mm -hmm. However, when a bush doctor mm -hmm. tells a patient to not take their prescribed medic medication, or when a, 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 a proclaimed doctor has a, a degree from God knows where, says that you could take their supplement and you could get cured or be cured, from that, be cured of diabetes. And that's why we have a problem. And Andrew, I'm, I'm happy it's coming from you because when I say things like that, patients may think or the public may think, oh, well, there he is a doctor. He's mm -hmm. saying that because he wants people to come to people like himself mm -hmm. and not go to the herbalist. Um, but you are part of the, you're president of the Diabetic Association. You're a, re a researcher. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, you're a real, soon you'll be a real doctor mm -hmm. in terms of a PhD. PhD. Um, I call the people with PhD, <laughs> PhDs, real doctors. <laughs> um, but yet you see the negative mm -hmm. um, outcomes of people. Um, and, and I think there's a huge onslaught it in is. the media. And, and yeah. that's why one of the reasons why we do this program, so we can counter mm -hmm. some of the misinformation mm -hmm. that's coming through. Um, and one of the things, and, and I, I'm sure the Diabetic Association will be um, trying to actively educate our patients, is that there's a huge amount of skepticism mm -hmm. about prescribed medication. medication. Yeah. And, and big pharma. It that's, is. that's yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and again, it's just because of the culture. But I think a lot of the times, and people say in Trinidad, the medication is not good enough. Yes. It's not working for them. But the thing about it, and I want to quote um, Dr. Hillbriggs from ADA, and she said that, and it's true because from research that ADA has, only about 10% of a person's um, disease outcome is medication. Yeah. Meaning that if you only take the medication that the doctor prescribes and you don't manage your diet, you don't exercise, you don't manage your stress, 
then it's not going to work. Yeah. That's just ten percent of what you're supposed to do. Right. So a lot of patients take the medications that the doctor prescribes. They do everything that they normally would do: sit down in front of the couch, don't move a muscle, and they say the medication is not working. Yeah, that's the reason why. Yeah. So the thing about it is that is why we are trying to educate people about the reasons why they need to keep taking their medication. Yeah. And we need to people like everybody likes a a quick quick fix. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, no matter how much money you spend. But no, no matter how much money people call for it, you might, you might want to do it because it seems so appealing. But that appeal, we need to work in and we need to regulate because people can't be going on television or going on radio, printing ads, saying that they have a cure, a for, cure diabetes, for diabetes. Yes. Or, they have, or they, 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 their supplement is better than medication. Yeah. They can't do that. So that's a huge area and I think we would have to revisit it. But we only have about eight more minutes. So mm -hmm. I want to talk about um, the promotional activities you have for leading for up to months. World Diabetes mm -hmm. Day. Um, I think we have a clip, so we probably could play the clip first, mm -hmm. and then we can just talk about some of the fundraising events and some of the things you have leading up to sure. World Diabetes Day. So, Josh, if we can play that um, second clip. Right, so that's a big symposium you're coming, mm -hmm. uh, having in coming up in November. But can you just run through quickly What's some of the on? other activities? So, so we have declared November's Diabetes Awareness Month. Right. And for the entire month, we're going to be doing activities to promote education and awareness. And the theme for this month is taking diabetes to heart. And we're really ex going to explore the link between cardiovascular disease and diabetes, especially coming out of the PAHO Hearts Initiative. We want to work together with the Ministry of Health and other companies, other, other partners, to, to educate people about the importance or impact of, of diabetes on heart disease. Um, so we have three or four main sets of activities. The first is the 10th of November, which is our that 5K, that run. Right. Um, so we're going to have a 5K in Chagonas, uh, which starts at Woodford Lodge, which is close to our office in Chagonas. Um, registration is $150, and you can register on our, on our, our Facebook pages or on Race Roster. And we want to have 1,000 people there at that 5K. At the start of the 5K, we want to make a blue circle with everybody. Right. So they're going to get blue t-shirts. So we're yes. going to be doing that. On the 14th, which is Diabetes, World Diabetes Day. Typically, we've only celebrated on World Diabetes Day. But this time, we say, you know what? We, need, we have to reach a lot of people, so let's do more. Mm -hmm. So on World Diabetes Day, every one of our 18 branches is going to do an activity in their area. So we're going to have about 18 or probably more simultaneous activities on World mm -hmm. Diabetes Day. So anywhere you go, you're going to be able to Reach Diabetes Association. And that's Thursday the 14th, Thursday the 14th of, of November. November, yes. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, we have the symposium that you just saw. And we named the, the symposium after Mr. Philip, Carlton Philip, who was our former president of the association. Um, I like to say the patriarch of the Diabetes Association. Mm -hmm. Although a lay person, he has been the person who has been pushing the Diabetes Association from nothing to where it was when I took over. Right. So the Diabetes Association um, is pushing the symposium at, well, pushing the symposium to not just our members, but also members of the public. So we're going to have it at the University of the West Indies in Engineering Room 1 and also JFP Auditorium. Right. Uh, the final event is our, our ball. So we're going to have the DAT ball um, at Paria Suites Hotel on, on Saturday 30th. Right. So that's going to be one of our major fundraising activities. Yeah. So throughout the month, we want to do fundraising, we want to do awareness, we want to do education yeah. activities. The, the, the symposium you're having on the 23rd, mm -hmm. um, again, uh, do people just go on the Facebook site? Do you have to register, pre-register? Is there a mm -hmm. cost yeah. to come to the symposium? So, so it's $80 for non-members, $60 for members. Right. They could go onto the Facebook page, but also contact our office at 672-0864. Right. Um, or just message us on Facebook. Right. Uh, when you come, $80 includes package material, breakfast and lunch. And then you're going to be exposed to the lectures. You're going to have forums, men's women's forums, and also at the booth. So we're going to have about 80 companies there who are going to be exhibiting. Right. So I just want to remind you of that uh, number for the Diabetic Association, 672-0864. Uh, 672-0864.
0861-6641. You also have a Facebook site, yep. the Diabetic Association of Trinidad and Diabetes. Tobago. Diabetes. Diabetes, Diabetes yeah. Association, Association of Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. And also I, Instagram. And, and also Instagram. So you're mm -hmm. getting a lot into technology. So there are various ways of um, contacting um, the Diabetic Association. Um, Andrew, we have covered a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I would encourage people, if you have questions, if you want to find out more about the Diabetes Association, please ring that number, 672-0864. If you have um, family members who are diabetics, um, mm -hmm. get involved with one of the diabetic associations, um, um, one of the branches, and um, get involved with some of the activities uh, for World Diabetes Month mm -hmm. in November. Mm -hmm. In closing, because uh, we just have about two or three more minutes, um, any closing thoughts for, the, for, for our audience? Mm -hmm. So the Diabetes Association is there for the members of the public. They're there. We, we are there to help you. We provide screening. We provide testing. We even have machines now. So if you, you come in, you could buy boxes of strips and you could get a free machine from the Diabetes Association. Right. Okay. So we are there to support, but we also need help. from. And that's, that's an appeal that I want to put out there. Yeah. We need volunteers. We need people to work with us. We put out a call recently on Facebook probably over the course of two weeks, and we had 200 people reaching out to wow. us, people that want to help, people who have people with living with diabetes in their family and want to help other people with diabetes. So if you want to volunteer in the Diabetes Association, you can message us on Facebook, message us on Instagram, give us a call. We're going to have meetings in your area soon. We've, we had one last week, Saturday, in Trigonos. We're going to have one soon in UWE. We'll have one in Trigonos, in um, Safanal. We'll have one in Tobago. And we want to bring volunteers out. We're going to train them how to do blood pressures and blood sugars send them out into communities. We're going to have larger events. We want to expand because we want to see not just the visibility of the association, but we want to see diabetes prevalence going down. Yes. Right? That's yes. what we want to do. That's what Absolutely. we want to see. Well, Andrew, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. And um, I think you are um, a valuable asset um, to the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago and um, to the future of diabetes care. Mm -hmm. um, I think partnering with... Um, other professionals. Um, I, I want to encourage you to get more doctors involved. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to get more involved with the Diabetes yeah. Association. So um, I'm looking forward to that as well. Mm -hmm. Good to have you. Thanks. I just want to remind you um, that this program is replayed on Thursdays at um, uh, 1 p.m. and Wednesday, uh, Sunday evenings at 6.30. And then we have another replay next week. Um, and we probably will play this program on the week of uh, World Diabetes Day. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, further questions, you can ring the Diabetic Association as I, I, I gave you the number, but you can also ring on 482-4269, 482-4269. You can also WhatsApp your questions on that um, number, um, and uh, we will try and respond as best as possible. So 482-4269, that's our personal number at our center, and we can pass on the questions to the Diabetes Association um, from the program. As I end tonight, um, I, I just want to encourage you. Um, as you know, I put on my pastoral hat, um, or pastoral cap as I end. I've been sharing with our faith community um, about anxieties and fears, and that can affect your diabetes as well. Um, if you are stressed out, if you are anxious, um, I want to encourage you that um, there are several scriptures I reflect on, but one is uh, by the Apostle Paul that talks about um, not to be anxious about anything, but uh, by prayer and um, just meditating on God, you can uh, come to a point in your life where you understand that there's a power higher than yourself, where you can take those cares and those uh, anxieties you have. I want to tell you, we all have stresses in our life. The key issue is how do you respond to the stresses that you face in your everyday life? And I encourage you, to develop the spiritual dimension of your life. And um, for me, it's what I've grown up in. Uh, for others, spirituality can be defined in a variety of ways. And by the way, um, I want to wish everyone a happy Diwali. It's coming up, um, I think it's the 27th, mm -hmm. 27th of um, October. Thank you for joining us on Your Health, Your Choice. Uh, tonight, it was, has been good to have uh, Mr. Andrew Danu with us, President of the Diabetic Association. We return with a live program, hopefully in two weeks' time. Um, and you can also um, look at the Facebook site for replays of this program. Thank you very much and good night.